Good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to all of you as I invite you all uh, for the special plenary session, ISID Foundation Day Lecture on Thoughts on India's Industrial Transformation by Dr. Nashad Forbes. To begin the session, I would like to invite Shri S. K. Mishra, Chairperson, ISID Board of Governors, to be on the stage, please. I invite Dr. Noshad Forbes to be on this stage, please. I also invite Professor Nagesh Kumar to join us on the stage. I request our chairperson to please uh, felicitate Dr. Nashad Forbes uh, with presentation of a bouquet. Um, can we have the bouquet? Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I request uh, Professor Nagesh Kumar to please take over the session. Good morning, our Chairman uh, Shri S. K. Mishra, Dr. Noshad Sos, the speaker of the day. Professor Krishna, all my very distinguished friends, young researcher colleagues, it's a real privilege to welcome you all to this morning special Foundation Day lecture of ISID by none other than Dr. Noshad Forbes. Anybody who has followed his columns and uh, his book, much celebrated book. Uh, let me let show, show I the advertising. <laughs> I hope you have all seen, and it has recently been, uh, you know, given uh, the CK Prahlad uh, Award for Best Business Book of the Year. So, so we are very privileged to have uh, Dr. Noshad Forbes with us this morning to share his thoughts on India's industrial transformation. So as I was saying that anybody who has followed his columns and heard him and read his book knows what a visionary thought leader we have with us today. And uh, over the past two and a half days, uh, we have heard so many talks and panel discussions, plenary roundtables, some 70 researchers, young researchers, some of you are here, uh, have presented your work. But this is one uh, session I was really looking forward to because uh, I have been reading his columns and uh, I know uh, what uh, Noshad represents. It's, you know, uh, someone who is deeply into industry, but is also a thinking economist and uh, always uh, thinking for the future of this country and how it can realize its promise uh, and uh, become a prosperous, inclusive, and sustainable nation. So without any further ado, I want to invite uh, Sri S.K. Mishra, our chairman, to make his opening remarks. You can do it from there, sir, or if you like, you want to come here and uh, welcome uh, our speaker. And then we are waiting for you. Dr. Narsad Forbes, a very distinguished member of our board and co-chairman 
of the Forbes Marshal, Professor Agesh Kumar, and ladies and gentlemen, I extend to you a very warm welcome to ISID's 2023 Foundation Day Lecture. At the outset, I must compliment our director for having organized this three-day conference on industrialization. We have reached a takeoff stage and are fast emerging as world's third largest economy, we are at present fifth largest. And the type is now opportune to have a fresh look at our industrial policy, what needs to be done, where we have gone wrong, where we have to focus on competitiveness, which is one of the basic issues in a global field. How do we meet the unemployment uh, problem, particularly at the rural level and even in other areas? And then the last few days, we've had a number of discussions, papers read, very useful, very incisive. And today we are privileged to have with us a very distinguished Dr. Forbes with us in this uh, Foundation Day lecture. We've been having these Foundation Day lectures since the beginning uh, in 1988. We have had very distinguished speakers, the former uh, Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh, former members of the Planning Commission, including Professor Hanuman Rao, Professor G.S. Bhalla, Sri Nitin Desai, former Minister Sri Mohan Dharia, and then Vice Chairman of Niti Ayog, Dr. Rajiv Kumar, and Chairman Maruti Suzuki, R.C. Bhargav. The 222 lecture last year was delivered by the Director General of UNIDO, Mr. Jared Muller. On the Foundation Day, it is only appropriate that we first pay our tributes to the memory of our founder, late Professor S.K. Goel, who envisages the ISID as a center of excellence dedicated to policy research on industrial development of India. Over a period of time, the Institute has gradually expanded the focus of its research, encompassing larger issues of industrialization, such as structural transformation and decent job creation. MSMEs and startups, foreign direct investment, trade competitiveness, technology and innovation, besides issues relating to corporate governance and competition policy in India. The central agenda of policy discussions at the current conjecture is to identify policy lessons for harnessing the potential of manufacturing in the country for decent job creation and foster inclusive growth. India cannot conceive of an inclusive growth without transforming a vast section of underemployed mass trapped in low productivity, jobs in agriculture or in the urban informal sector to gainful employment and productive industrial activities. Reaping the demographic dividend in India requires a faster growth of manufacturing that can easily absorb the huge labor force released from agriculture. In a globalized world, this simply means 
creating industries that are capable of competing in the local and global markets. In today's world, with threats of climate change looming large, it is also important not only to think of industrial growth, but an industrial development that is ecologically sustainable. We need to build our industrial capacities on those lines and also drive the process of industrialization through strategies and policies, ensuring a sustainable and more equitable distribution of income. In this context, the theme of today's lecture, namely thoughts on industrial transformation to, de to be delivered by Dr. Nasad Forbes is indeed very timely. Dr. Forbes has emerged as a big champion of industrialization and innovation in the country. He has been writing regularly on these themes. His highly celebrated and award book, about which the director just made reference to, Struggle and Promise, Restoring India's Potential, has made a strong case for tapping India's potential for industry, for achieving wider development goals, including to greater internationalization and innovative activity. Dr. Noshad has a unique distinction of being a trained economist at Stanford PhD and is also an industrialist. He is co-chair of Forbes Marshall, India's leading process control and energy efficient efficiency company. He established the Center for Technology, Innovation and Economic Research, CTIER, in Pune. He is also chairman of Aspen Ananta Center. He has served as president of CIA and currently serves on ISID board of governors, among many others. With these few words, I now invite Professor Norsad to take the floor. Mr. S.K. Mishra, my friend Nagesh, uh, many friends in the audience, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, the privilege of being with you this morning. And Nagesh, special thanks for adjusting schedules so that this could work out for us. I'm privileged to be here at this ICIT conference. Uh, and I'm privileged to be here uh, for different reasons. I'm privileged that our chairman uh, is chairing the session, appreciate that very much. And uh, I understand that it's his birthday day after tomorrow. So uh, <laughs> our greetings in advance. And I'm privileged to talk about a subject that I've been thinking about more than, more than working on for many years. You've all been working on it for many years. Um, and so it's a special pleasure to share some thoughts with you. And I uh, uh, emphasize to Nagesh that the lecture should be called Thoughts on Industrial Transformation um, because they really are thoughts. I hope you'll think that they're reasonably well thought through thoughts, but they're still thoughts. And I hope that it will prompt uh, a rich discussion that we can have uh, after, after these initial comments. Our chairman has already very clearly and nicely articulated what industrial transformation means for India, what kind of shifts uh, we need to see uh, happen in the years ahead. When Nagesh and I were talking about this session today, um, the original title had the word innovation in it as well. And I noticed too that in the program, uh, there's a separate track uh, on technology and innovation, um, which is, uh, I think, very important to India's future. Indeed, I would argue that industrial transformation in our country is not possible without seriously increased investment in innovation 
seriously increased investment in technology and building technical capacity, and seriously increased investment in R&D. And that it, this investment in R&D, um, while there is a role for policy and there is a role for changes in state R&D policy, the key role has to be within in-house industry R&D. The key change has to be that Indian industry needs to become much more, much more serious about its investment in in-house R&D. Why? Many, many industries, many countries have prospered for decades without serious investment in R&D. If you take Japan in the 50s and 60s, if you take the, the biggest success stories of industrialization, if you like, Japan in the 50s and 60s, South Korea and Taiwan in the 60s and 70s, um, China certainly until the 90s, until the 90s, you see these countries prospering, Bangladesh, Vietnam today, you see these countries prospering without serious investment in R&D. Why then do we need to? It all comes down actually to a subject that you are all much more familiar than I am, which is industrial structure. For various historical reasons, uh, we as a country have an industrial structure that is the structure of a much richer country than we actually are. If you look at the proportion of total industrial output that comes from sectors such as pharmaceuticals and chemicals, auto and auto components, um, engineering and capital goods, uh, hardware, technology hardware, um, we have the industrial structure of a country uh, which is much ahead of us uh, in terms of per capita GDP. If you look normally at a country at our level of per capita GDP, you would see the industrial structure data dominated by textiles and garments, leather and footwear, food and beverage. These would be the sectors that would tend to be much stronger players. They would also tend to be much more labor intensive players um, with all those benefits that flow from that. But that's not our subject today. Our subject today is that we have the industrial structure that we have. Uh, we are more skill and capital intensive uh, than most countries at our level of per capita GDP. We, um, we even if you go back to say 19, you go back to 2000, say when China was at the midpoint of its industrial transformation, um, it still had much a much higher share of its industrial output coming from these lower technology sectors um, than we had. Uh, if you look at South Korea, even in 1990, it had a much more, it, it had a higher share of its GDP, of its industrial output coming from these labor intensive sectors than we had, even though South Korea in 1990 was much richer than we were. So that's the reason why we have this industrial structure that is inherently skill and capital intensive. And if a skill and capital intensive industrial structure is going to be dynamic and successful and grow very rapidly over time, it then needs innovation and needs serious investment in technology and R&D. So I have a suggestion also as questions, uh, which you may have already researched. I'm sure many of you have been looking at but as we look at shifts between sectors in our industrial sec in our industrial uh, structure, I think it would also be useful and interesting to look at shifts within sectors. So to look not just at how much of a shift is taking place in terms of total industrial output, but also look within particular sectors. So look at the auto and auto component sectors. Do we seem to see greater and greater shifts towards uh, higher tier auto component suppliers, for example, which is where a lot of the technology tends to reside. Um, do we see a shift in pharma and chemicals again to higher and higher value added products? I would argue, by the way, that we do. Um, do we see a shift in engineering and capital goods, which uh, was seen as very high potential some years ago um, when Sanjay Alal and others were doing work in this area? 
Um, do we see a shift uh, towards, again, greater, more proprietary value-added engineering companies emerging that then sell their products around the world? And I think these shifts within sectors is also something that we could very valuably look at. Let me give you some background on overall global R&D. Uh, some of you will be familiar with these numbers, but just so that we're all on the same, the same platform before talking about what we have in India and how we differ and therefore what we need to do. R&D is, as you know, a pretty massive enterprise worldwide. The world spends uh, a little over $2 trillion a year on R&D, uh, a little over 2% of global GDP. Even more though, R&D is not a democratic thing. It tends to be highly concentrated. It's very concentrated by country, five countries, um, the US, China, Japan, Germany, and South Korea account for over three quarters of all the R&D done worldwide. Within overall R&D data, Firms, it's concentrated in firms. Industry accounts for over two thirds of all the R&D done worldwide. And within industry, it's also concentrated. The top four industries, pharmaceuticals, not pharmaceuticals and chemicals, just pharmaceuticals, software, technology, hardware, and auto accounts for around, accounts for over 60% of all the R&D done by industry. And within industry, again, it's concentrated within giant firms. Uh, the top 20 firms that invest in R&D account for over 20% of all industrial R&D done worldwide. I mean, just think about it, 20 firms, um, the likes of Alphabet um, and uh, uh, Siemens um, and, um, uh, Apple, uh, Huawei, Samsung, uh, these are giant spenders and investors in R&D. 20 firms account for over 20% of what millions of firms worldwide do. So it's a very concentrated, it's a very concentrated uh, subject. Now, how do, how do we differ in India? Um, first, uh, we spend relatively little on R&D. Uh, India's total investment in R&D um, is about $17, $18 billion a year. Uh, that compares with about $800 billion in the U.S., the top spender, uh, about $600 billion in China, uh, which comes second. Um, as, as you know, we're number five in GDP. We're number 20 in total R&D spending. And this applies, by the way, in terms of the ranking. If you rank according to PPP, then uh, we move up from being number 20 uh, to being number 12. But then you must also move us up in terms of GDP from number five to number three. So in PPP terms for both GDP and R&D spending, um, we would be number 12 in terms of R&D spending, uh, number three in terms of GDP. How else do we differ? Industry accounts for a relatively small share of total R&D. In the world, industry accounts for about 70, 71% of total R&D investment. In India, it accounts for around 40%. Second, research done within universities is around 7% of total R&D in India, um, around 17% worldwide. So what do we need to do? If you work out the numbers, it tells you that we spend about 0.3% of GDP on in-house R&D done within industry, uh, which compares with a world average of 1.5%. And we spend around 0.05% of GDP on research done within the higher education system, which compares with 0.4% for the world average. So the two numbers, I'm giving you too many numbers, but the two numbers I want you to remember is five and eight. Um, first, we need to raise our share of investment done 
of in-house R&D done as a share of GDP um, from by a factor of five, from 0.3 to 1.5% of GDP. And second, we need to raise the amount of research we do in our higher education system from 0.05 to 0.4% or eight times um, of GDP. Why is it important to do research in the higher education system? I'll make a quick mention on that uh, and then get back to industry. Um, it's important, especially for industry, as a flow of talent. Uh, by doing research within the higher education system, yes, you get some useful research coming out, but that's not the objective. Uh, the objective is actually the flow of talent. Um, you know, I, I was a student at Stanford University for many years, and Stanford is always held up as this great exemplar of um, connect, connection with industry, doing great research, and so on. But I would make the argument that if the world had never seen any of the research output of Stanford University, it might just might be a slightly worse off place. Um, but if it had not seen the benefit of Stanford's graduates, it would be a much worse off place. Uh, and the same is true of any great, any great higher education institute. Take our most vibrant research, acad academic research institute, which most people would agree is the Indian Institute of Chemical Technology in, uh, in Mumbai, uh, which is, I think, still better known by its old name of UDCT. And if you take UDCT, UDCT is famous for its connection with industry, for its flow of very good research that has been often picked up by industry. But I would make the same argument for it, that India might be slightly worse off if it had never seen UDCT's output of research. But look at the graduates of UDCT. Um, Ashwin Dani, who passed away recently, uh, M.M. Sharma, who led uh, UDCT itself, um, Anji Reddy of Dr. Reddy's labs. Um, uh, I can give you maybe 15 names, uh, Mukesh Ambani at, of Reliance, um, uh, Navrotam Seksaria of Ambuja. Um, there's a list that goes on and on. Madhukar Parikh of Pidalite. These are all the graduates of UDCT. And so when you have a flow of talent, that's what transforms countries in every respect. And that's why doing research within the higher education system is so powerful. And when we do it instead in autonomous laboratories, um, we miss that benefit of this flow of talent. So to come back to industry and those two numbers, uh, so five times in tr growth in industry R&D, eight times growth in higher education R&D. Those numbers would mean a transformation in our R&D and innovation system like no other. And it would drive, it would support, and it would cohabit with our overall industrial transformation. How do we bring this about? I think we can learn from the experience of other countries that did just this. And Nagesh's work on other countries and the work that many of you have done illustrates some of this. To me, the two most striking examples of industrial transformation in economic history are the transformation that South Korea went through between 1970 and 1990, and China went through between the late 90s and now. What do you see happening in these two countries in these 20 year periods? In South Korea, uh, during that period of time, and China during the same 20 year period, but much later between 1998, say in 2018, you have GDP growing very rapidly. GDP in both countries is growing at 9, 10% each year for those 20 years. Second, the industry share of total R&D spending is rising very rapidly. Sorry, second, the R&D share as a percentage of GDP rises very rapidly in these countries. So in South Korea and in China, it goes from around 
in South Korea from around 0.4% of GDP in 1970 to about 2.5% of GDP by 1990. In China, it goes from around 0.6% of GDP uh, in, two, in 1998, uh, 1996 anyway, to around 2.4% today. So you see the R&D share uh, offers a share of GDP rising very rapidly in both countries. And the industry share of R&D also rises very rapidly. In South Korea, it essentially flips. It goes from 15% of all R&D to 85% of all R&D between 1970 and 1990. In China, it goes from, again, about 30% uh, of total R&D done in the country to around 70% today. What this ends up giving you, and when I do these, when I did these sums for the first time, um, I kept saying I've done something wrong because the number that I got was so striking. What it says is that between 1970 and 1990, South Korean industry spent, in 1990, spent a thousand times more in real terms on R&D than it did in 1970, a thousand times. Um, to me, it's the most impressive rise in R&D investment and change in industrial structure that any country has experienced. In China, between 1998 and 2018, the rise is a little over 100 times. Again, a very impressive change. But remember, 1,000 times in South Korea, 100 times in, India, uh, in, in China. During the same two periods, in 1970 to 1990, and, and 1998 to 2018, our share of uh, in total Indian industrial investment in in-house R&D rises by about 15 times. 15 times is good, but it's 15 times compared with over 100 times in China and compared with 1,000 times in South Korea. So that's the, that's the challenge in many ways. This is a moving target. Uh, you know, countries don't obligingly stay still while we catch up with them. Um, so they keep moving ahead. And if we wish to catch up with them, we have to move that much faster. How did South Korea and China do this? Um, you're all very well placed to answer this. But as you know, huge shifts in industrial structure, a shift towards auto and auto components, a shift towards semiconductors in South Korea, particularly, and more recently in China, a shift towards consumer electronics and technology hardware in both countries, uh, and away from textiles and garments again in both countries. And within, indus within industrial sectors, you see the kind of technology deepening uh, that I was talking about earlier. Uh, in some sectors today, uh, Chinese industry is quite dominant. There are three sectors that we don't normally associate with being technology intensive, material science, mining, and construction, where Chinese firms, if you look at the world's top 2,500 R&D investors, over half of all the firms are Chinese firms in material science, in mining, and in construction. And these are sectors that China has really made its own through these massive investments in in-house R&D. Yes, supported by the state, but driven largely by in-house industrial R&D. So what does that say for us in India? What are our prospects and what do we need to do? I think we need to do two things. First, there are two sectors where we have a decent showing in terms of uh, uh, investments in R&D pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals and chemicals actually, and auto and auto components. In both sectors, our industrial investment in R&D is somewhat lower than the world average, but it's still decent. If you look at the pharma sector, the for our Indian, Indian industry, in the Indian pharmaceutical sector invests just under 10% of turnover in R&D. The world average is more, it's about 16% but still 10% is decent. 9% actually is the number is decent. The same in auto. In auto, we invest around three to 4%. World average is a bit more, 6% or so. It's a decent 
percentage of investment. So where's the issue? The issue is that the, our auto firms and our pharmaceutical firms are relatively small by international standard and relatively less profitable. So we need to see a transformation in the overall scale of our pharmaceutical sector and auto sector and how it then invests also more and more in R&D. Second, some of our most successful firms need to deepen their technology footprints. Um, I did this exercise for an article recently where uh, we compared the 10 most, the 10 most profitable non-financial firms um, in, uh, in five countries. So in India, uh, in the US, in, uh, in China, in Germany, and in Japan, uh, the, five, the five top economies worldwide. And if you look at the top 10, and, and we did non-financial in all countries because financial firms don't invest much in R&D uh, anywhere. So we said, take non-financial firms. And if we look, when we looked at the numbers, the most striking data, um, you know, if you look at profit rates, if you look at turnover, yes, our firms are somewhat smaller among our, our most successful firms, but they're still pretty world scale. Um, if you look at profitability, our profitability as a percentage of sales is actually higher uh, than most of the other countries in the list, maybe with the exception of the US because of the dominance of the tech sector. The one striking difference is, as a, is the investment in R&D as a percentage of profit. Um, in China, the US, Japan, and Germany, those firms invest between about a third and a half of total profit in R&D. For us, it's 2%. So it's 2% versus between 29 and 55% of profit invested in R&D. And these are firms in the oil and gas sector. These are firms in steel and mining. These are firms uh, in consumer goods. Uh, these are firms in telecom. So the difference in structure is not so striking. The difference in how much we invest in R&D is striking. And I think we should start seeing um, some of our most successful firms taking technology much more serious, seriously. When I've gone around and talked to friends in industry, I always ask them about this and talk about this. And the general sense I have is that we think we're doing okay. We actually think we're doing a fair amount of R&D. So what we've been pushing recently is a benchmarking exercise where we get the firm to say, take your top 10 or 20 firms in your industry worldwide, look at how much they invest in R&D, look at how many R&D engineers they have, look at the qualifications of those engineers, and then look at the total output in terms of new products released year on year on year, um, and compare it and do a benchmarking exercise with your own firm. When we've done that, I think in every case, uh, the firm has started saying, okay, let's start engaging now more, let's see where the gaps are, et cetera. There are now some signs of change at the individual firm level. So firms like Bajaj Auto, um, I, was, I went around their R&D center recently. It's a world scale and world-class facility. It's really good to see. And Bajaj Auto is a large firm. So it has, it's a highly profitable firm. It has the potential to emerge as one of these world-leading R&D firms. Companies like Godrej um, are smaller today relative to world scale, but again, are investing much more in R&D. The same for companies like Blue Star. So we're starting to see firms take R&D much more seriously. Um, I'm waiting for the day when, you know, a Reliance, a Tata Steel, the really big profitable manufacturing companies in the country take R&D more seriously, and especially our software industry takes R&D more seriously. If you look at our software industry, um, we have on average roughly twice the world's profitability in terms of uh, uh, profit as a percentage of sales. 
um, we invest in our top 10 software firms 1% of turnover in R&D. The, the world average is around 11%. And everyone says, well, that's because the world does product software and we do services software. True. But if you look at the top 10 Chinese firms, um, eight of which are in services, <laughs> Um, they invest 8% of turnover in R&D. So I think every way, when you, only when you do a serious benchmarking exercise, I think do firms start realizing for themselves where the gap lies. So I think we're now starting to get to being on the cusp of change as firms start to take R&D more and more seriously. And I don't know if any of you have friends in the... Uh, financial business in, you know, who are financial analysts, but, or if your students, especially, I imagine you all have lots of students who have ended up, uh, you know, that's what economics grads do. They go off and become financial analysts, unfortunately, um, but let them do something useful. What they should do that's useful is that they should start questioning firms in all the earnings briefings on what they're doing on R&D. Uh, today, the role is somewhat negative. Um, there was this striking news article, I, I don't know if any of you saw it, uh, a few months ago, when Biocon was attacked for the amount it was investing in R&D. Um, and um, their share price fell because they said, you're investing too much in R&D. Um, I thought that was just a terrible thing. It should be the opposite, right? Because it should be that the firm is investing um, more strongly for its long-term future. So I think we need a major education effort uh, to also enhance the understanding of our financial community in what investments um, are worthwhile in the long run. A last comment, um, coming back again to higher education. Uh, all of you would have read the recent coverage on the National Research Foundation that has recently been announced. And the National Research Foundation has the potential to be quite transformative for us as a country. It has the potential for being transformative uh, because it has two very valuable provisos in it and requirements in it. It says first 50,000 crores over five years. Um, it's, and it says that all of the research that will be funded requires an academic uh, researcher a researcher connected with an academic institution. That's very, very powerful. The fact that it requires an academic researcher is what will then feed through into this talent flow. Second, it says academic researchers from both public and private institutions are eligible. Again, very healthy and very forward-looking. It gets one thing, I think, completely wrong, which is it says that two-thirds of the funding is going to come from industry. Uh, out of the 50,000 crores. And I'm a complete skeptic because I think we have to first expect Indian industry to invest much more in in-house R&D for its own in-house R&D and then create that draw on the public research system before we expect Indian industry to support public research um, in general. But potentially transformative and done right, implemented right, uh, could have a very useful effect. As I said, these are thoughts. Uh, I hope you agree that they are decently thought through thoughts, but they are thoughts. Um, and one of the points I come back to and keep asking myself is, does total investment really matter? Can we be really efficient in our investments uh, in R&D and, uh, and therefore get much more than, than others can with less spending? The answer is almost surely yes. If you look at the annual Global Innovation Index rankings, you know the Global Innovation Index that's done each year um, has a bunch of input indicators that get measured and a bunch of output indicators that get measured. We have for years ranked much better on output indicators than on input indicators. And what that says is that we do a relatively efficient job of converting inputs into outputs. 
So relative to other countries, for what we spend on R&D, we get a higher return and a greater benefit. If that's true, we should do much more of it. Let me stop there, and then you'll have time for discussion and questions. Thank you. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Noshar. Uh, this is, I mean, uh, this is exactly what we were expecting. And you have lived up to your reputation. And it was uh, scintillating based on very deep research, not just uh, random thoughts that you modestly tried to put it. And uh, so now there is some time, fortunately, to take some questions. And I'm sure he would enlighten all of us. While thinking. Thinking. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. So who wants to go? Uh, yeah, I see Radhika. I see a young lady over there. And I see Nagaraj, uh, a fellow Puneite. I know. <laughs> you know we, Yes. We met, we met um, how many years? 30 years ago oh. with Ashok Desa. Oh, really? In uh, a study he was doing on R&D in Indian industry. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That was a very important issue. And then, yes. And so I already have uh, five... Uh, Hands. So, Radhika, why don't you begin and then I come to all others in that sequence. Really fascinating lecture, Mr. Forbes. It was a pleasure to listen to you. And I think some of the statistics that you highlighted were absolutely startling. Uh, I'm hoping we'll get a hard copy or a soft copy of the lecture after this. Uh, so you highlighted the importance of in-house R&D. Yeah. Uh, what I wanted to understand was that you know, if markets underprice innovation, is there any role for the state to push in-house R&D uh, or to incentivize it in some manner? And also, I wanted to, you know, break this question up by looking at it through the lens of both the large firms, you know, the top 10 or the top 20 that you're talking about versus the medium sized firms. Because in the, as you explained, in the case of, you know, the top 10 or 20 firms, despite having the profitability and the right skills, uh, they may be under investing in in-house R&D. But for a lot of medium sized firms, which are dynamic, but are simply constrained uh, because of their inability to access resources, they may be underestimated, under investing in R&D. So is there um, any role for the state there to push in-house R&D? Very pointed question. Yeah. Maybe we can sure. collect uh, sure. a few. Uh, so uh, Nagaraj, uh, can you please pass on? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Naushan, uh, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, yeah, two questions. One is, uh, uh, what did, what exactly did South Korea do? do uh, in the 90s onwards mm. to increase its uh, R&D expenditure as a percentage of GDP. Uh, and uh, what did we do that during the same period, our R&D expenditure declined? Thank yeah. you. Uh, Professor Nack. Well, uh, Dr. Forbes, uh, brilliant uh, lecture. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, there were many ideas uh, that one had, which were clarified. And uh, so uh, what I want to check, it may be an observation or it may be regarded as a question as well. Uh, the interesting point for me was the fact that you were emphasizing in-house research in industry, as well as more research in universities yep. moving towards R&D that will bring about a difference in the industry structure. Now, uh, just going back briefly into the kind of history we've had, I think uh, in the 50s, when we thought in terms of the IITs and so forth, Pandit Nehru was also careful to emphasize institutions like CSIR and such others. There were several others, which would have done research, which would be available to all agents that were in the field of industrial growth and so forth and so on. Now, as we have seen, possibly the results of that were not very substantial. 
possibly. And that resulted in our R&D picture being not very good. So what you are suggesting, I think is very important and needs to be taken very seriously. But the only difference now is that the, in the earlier setting, we thought in terms of innovation and R&D, et cetera, to be something like a public good available mm -hmm. to all, but it didn't really work out that way. There was under uh, supply of uh, resources getting into that sector. Whereas if we do an in-house thing in industry, it'll be more of a private kind of activity. So the publicness will be less, but presumably this will give the advantage of greater uh, profit uh, seeking activities and greater dynamism. And this would be consistent with something like what Shumpita talks about in his focus on innovation. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is the essence of capitalism for Schumpeter. So, brilliant yeah. uh, yeah. lectures. Yeah. Thank you. These are yeah, questions. and then Satyaki. Okay, a young lady. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Forbes. Extremely uh, stimulating. There's one phrase in political economy which is sort of, uh, uh, you know, a, a rontier uh, class. So, if which typically underinvests in innovation. Uh, you know, it's mm. it may be a bad word, but it, it's worthwhile exploring that when we are looking at benchmarks. If we say look at the top uh, 100 industrial houses in India and see uh, are they sort of to, are they sort of above or below average in terms of diversification, particularly diversification into sectors such as, for example, the one that you mentioned, finance or, or real estate, and and whether that has an influence on their plowing back a share of their profits, how does that compare to the rest of the world? You know, do they tend to be more diversified into these sectors as against others? Because I have both a personal experience. I grew up in Ahmedabad, a lot of friends who were earlier invested in the textile industry. Half of them went into real estate, the other half went to do chemicals. The chemicals lot continued to invest in innovation. The real estate lots, you know, took a different direction altogether. Uh, similarly, we know the, you know, the well-known story of General Electric. You know, the more they invested in finance, the less they, they put their sort of foot off uh, of the uh, innovation uh, accelerator in a sense. So is that one of the influence? If so, there, there, that's the other sort of structural uh, obstacle that we might have to encounter in our efforts to raise uh, private sector. But uh, you know, I do not know enough and would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, the young lady over there and then no. Okay, you go first. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir, once again for this wonderful lecture. Uh, the, in the beginning of, of your lecture, what you probably tried to lay down the relationship between per capita income of different countries and the kind of industrial structure that evolved in, in the case of Japan and other South Korea and other countries, where we find in case of India, there is a kind of disconnect between the per capita income and the nature of industries that evolved. Now, this is given to us. And now if you are thinking for a change, innovation also depends upon the kind of demand that is generated in the domestic economy and also the kind of demand that they face. Is it the case that we would not be able to reach at the moment the level where China or US or these countries have reached? This is a distant possibility, or we will, so it is difficult to become like that, given the low base that we have in terms of demand. But the other option is to step back and become, a follow the uh, uh, trajectory of Vietnam or Indonesia, where we basically depend upon labor intensive kind of industrialization. So what would be the option or both uh, that we can follow? The young lady over there. Uh, Small, small question, sir. Sir, you mentioned that uh, our R&D, as we compare to input and output, our, we are productive when we compare these two. And is it that because of the diminishing marginal returns out of this R&D, our inputs, and when we look at closely this uh, pharma and chemical, in real terms, in India, it is declined. They are spending more, but in real terms, it is declined. Is it because of that? Or if it is because of that, how can we encourage more R&D? Uh, that's the question. And in also, what is the alternatives in a poor country like India 
whether we can really catch up these countries. Thank you. Uh, Sanjay, first, this lady is waiting for. Um, hello, sir. My name is Pompey. I'm a PhD student at IIT Roper. So first of all, thank you for such an informative uh, lecture. And as ma'am has rightly pointed out, we'd be hoping for a soft copy or a hard copy of the lecture. Uh, so my question is, and uh, pardon me for my lack of knowledge if I'm wrong. So uh, you have uh, rightly pointed out the importance of R&D expenditure in the industry sector. So what my knowledge is that low intense when talking in terms of India, uh, low tech uh, firms, uh, low, low tech industries such as uh, textiles or food and beverages or weaving industries or manufacture of uh, furniture, such industries, they do not require high tech R&D expenditures for progress or for development or for upgradation. At the same time, we cannot deny the importance of these industries because India is a country which has abundance of low skilled labor force. So um, taking this scenario, how do you suggest that the policy should be to upgrade these technologies, uh, the, these industries? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Professor Krishna is, uh, is there Professor Krishna? and very insightful, but I would like to draw attention to the question of scientific temper. I think we are we are really regressing in terms of scientific temper. That is that should, that is a point which should be uh, addressed. Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, there are a couple of more hands, but I think we can probably. <laughs> yeah, my basic what, question is that. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah my so I think uh, this will be the. Uh, can you hold on? Uh, so we will be the. Yeah, yeah. My basic question is that uh, we are seeing that you know a lot of these MNCs, for example, Microsoft and Dell, you know, invest in R and D in India, but they do it for their you know own. I mean, uh, business models. Right. They do not. They they are not able to you know. Uh, I mean, uh, bring up the products that can you know uh, solve the. Uh, I mean, the issues regarding the India regarding the sustainability and regarding you know uh, in, improving the purchasing power, improving the lifestyle, etc. For India, you know, and for that you know we have to depend on a lot more you know what to call uh, rural uh, economy rural i mean innovation etc you know uh, right. google innovation etc which may not be very big on commercials yeah. so how, how can you yeah. so thank how you can we... so i think uh, as you can see there is, you have generated already right. <laughs> a lot of interest so right. over to you uh, so uh, first first of all thank you those were those were wonderful questions um and i mean many of them many of them would justify a good long discussion, and I mean discussion. Yeah, but let me have a shot at as many of them as I as I can. Right? Um, you know, should firms be incentivized to invest in R and D? Uh, you know, we we had a very good scheme. Uh, we had a scheme where we had a two hundred percent weighted deduction. It first came in as a one fifty percent deduction. Then it was extended to two hundred. It was first focused on the pharma industry and auto, I think. Um, then it extended to all industry. And it was in play for around, for all industry for about five or six years. I'll just tell you how what we did it with, with it. When the 200% weighted deduction came in, we worked out what that benefit came to for us as a firm. And we said, okay, it comes to so many crores a year. So we said, we will grow our total number of R&D engineers in that proportion. So we expanded the number of R&D engineers. We said we'd do it in a year. It took us two years or three years by the time you can hire all of the talent. But it grew our R&D department actually by 50% over about a three or four year period. And it was prompted by that weighted deduction that came in. Now, then the weighted deduction went away uh, with a lower tax rate regime later on. Um, we still have the large R&D department and it's, it produces a regular flow of products. And we were producing a regular flow of new products. We now produce more regular flow of new products. So it was a very, to me, productive incentive. Um, we tried at Steer to look at the impact that it had, that how many firms like us increased their R&D investment as a result of that 200% weighted deduction. And what we found was that if you look at the top 20 R&D spenders in the country, 
there did not seem to be a significant impact. But if you went beyond the top mm. 20 to the next 200, uh, you see a significant impact. Now, why that is, I don't know, right? But it was a striking, to us, it was quite a striking thing, which is that the bigger R&D spenders, which are still relatively modest by international standards, mm. did not seem to benefit from this 200% deduction, at least in terms of expanding their R&D investments. Um, but medium to large, as opposed to very large mm. firms, did seem to benefit from it. So is there a role? There's probably a good role uh, for incentivizing investments in technology, and one needs to find the right mechanism, um, maybe incentivizing only increases as opposed to the base number itself, um, such that you know mm. something that you can do uh, to really incentivize ramping up investments in R&D. Uh, I think particularly in pharma and auto, is and it may be engineering is where the where the real scope and potential and chemicals lies. Um, it brings one to the broader question, which I think also came up: um, Why do firms invest in R and D? Uh, firms invest in R and D um, not for their own health. They invest around the world in R and D because they're afraid that they will be they will be destroyed otherwise mm. by competition. So someone mentioned Schumpeter. And Schumpeter's, uh, you know, one of his five sources of innovation, um, one of his, you know, the, the whole sort of what's the, the gales of creative destruction is all about firms having to compete one with the other on the basis of R&D and innovation. Uh, not uh, he didn't talk so much about R&D, but he talked very much about innovation um, on the basis of coming out with new products or new ways of serving customers or new new markets or new sources of supply and so on. And it was the it was the whole the whole that either invest in innovation um, or or be destroyed. And I think that threat of destruction is very very important and very powerful. Um, the it's why you need competitive markets, but you need, you both need competition and you need high quality competition, if you ask me. So you need, comp you know, we have very competitive markets in the country, I think, these days. Um, I think there's scope for higher quality competition um, and more and more firms that compete on features. Um, and when we put trade barriers up, um, we limit that high quality competition, which I think otherwise can be quite powerful. The question on what did South Korea do? Why did ours decline? Um, so our R&D spending didn't decline, but as our GDP grew, um, you know, if you, when, we, when I've tried, you know, I would not make, all I'd say is I would not make too much of the 0.6 going to 0.8% and coming back to 0.6 um, for two reasons. Um, there's a bad reason, and I'm saying this even though, uh, you know, Dr. Anant is here. Um, but first of all, our R&D statistics are really bad. Mm. Um, now, they're bad in many parts of the world, but in, in India, they're really bad. Um, we do not count, for example, R&D done within MNCs. Mm. So we do not count R&D that is not reported by firms registered with DSIR. So, for example... In Steer, one of the services we provide is we provide a list of the top 200 R&D spenders. Um, and to do that, we go through CMI data saying that we know this firm spends a lot on R&D, get the number from them, <laughs> right? Um, but not because it's not available as a part of an official source. So for example, the world's, one of, one of India's 10 largest spenders in absolute terms on R&D is TCS. They still only spend 1% of turnover on R&D, but it still, it still comes to about $300 million. It doesn't show in the official data ever, right? And it doesn't because they don't classify it um, with DSR. So it doesn't show in the official data. So, I mean, there are examples like this that one needs to get, and then the MNC data is just missing, right? Um, so, what did South Korea do? I mean, if you look at the 
uh, the big shift was into new industries. So starting in the 1970s, you see the shift into auto. So you see the rise of firms like Hyundai um, that become significant R&D investors uh, in South Korea. And you see the rise of Samsung more than anything else. Um, Samsung, which starts off life as a, uh, as a textile firm making wool, uh, wool, wool products, wool, wool, uh, making wool uh, fabric, um, ends up becoming this giant semiconductor firm. First goes into consumer electronics earlier on, and then goes into semiconductors. And the semiconductor field then demands massive investments in R&D. Massive investments to the scale where today Samsung invests more in R&D than all of India. Um, one firm, right? So $20 billion a year, uh, more than every firm in India and the government put together. Uh, so it's a massive R&D enterprise um, these days. And that then shows in the data. And it shows strikingly for South Korea. I mean, South Korea grew its R&D rapidly between 1970 and 1990, and then kept right on going from 1990 onwards. Today, South Korea is the world's largest investor in R&D as a percentage of GDP together with Israel, just under 5% of GDP. I mean, big numbers uh, compared with, say, the US at 3%. So big numbers. Yeah. Um, the question on what happened with CSIR and its role. Okay, let me be very crass uh, since this was titled Thoughts. Um, if we had never seen CSIR, I'm not sure what we would have missed as a country. I mean, I'm not so sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so you know, it's good to good to engage on because um, if you look at if you look at and I'm saying CSI, right? I'm not saying uh, UDCT, UDCT, etc. <laughs> okay. Huh? Yeah. So that if you look at CSR, you look at the you look at the attempt, it was based on a particular model of innovation. And the model of innovation that people had in their heads was a linear model of innovation. That research would lead to development, would lead to production, would lead to marketing. Right. And if you look at what people have said, is that is that a is that a path of innovation? Yes, it is. Is that the dominant way in which the world innovates? Actually, no. The dominant way in which the world innovates is it starts with the market and a market need. It goes into development. Occasionally, it goes into research when you cannot answer the questions that you are trying to answer uh, with straight developing the product you want to. And if you can, then it goes into research and then again goes back to marketing. So that the model that people talk about as being the more powerful model for innovation is what they call a chain link model. So starts with the market, ends with the market. The role of research is important, but it's important as a last resort. It's important when everything else fails, when your own ability to develop is not adequate without drawing on a wider research base. I think that's where CSR has struggled. It's not that the work that they do or the scientists who are there are in any way anything other than really good. They are. But the model of innovation that would require CSR to contribute is very different to how innovation happens actually in firms. Mm -hmm. So it was designed for firms and for industry. If you read the objective for CSR, it's very clear that it's for industry. But if you look at connections with industry, if you look at the percentage of total CSR revenue that comes and total funding that comes from industry, from all industry, um, it's very small, it's under 20%. If you look at the total model of CSR, CSR in India was set up about the same time as there was a equivalent institute in the UK. There was one also set up in Australia. 
There was one also set up in South Africa, all called CSR, by the way, in South Africa and in Australia. Both have since moved on and reformed their existing systems. In the UK, C DSIR, as it was called in the UK, has gone away. Um, we tried in the 50s to set up another institution to connect CSR with industry called NRDC. Still exists. It didn't work in terms of actually bringing about those connections with industry. And the argument I would have is that the model of innovation itself that we have in our heads that would enable CSR to work is not reflective of reality. It doesn't reflect of the dominant way in which innovation takes place. Uh, the question on the rentier class in the top 100 industrial houses, you know, I would defend, you know, th that's also, uh, people also use the phrase trading mentality. And I've heard this from many people saying that, look, Indian industry has a trading mentality. I would defend a trading mentality. I mean, as an economist, I mean, this is probably an audience of largely e economists, right? Um, I mean, what is economics except, um, except, uh, you would see it as an inefficient market, right? Um, if, uh, if you did not close the gap between <laughs> demand and supply, if you did not close the gap between marginal cost and marginal pricing, yeah. right? I mean, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't economics require a trading mentality um, for it to actually deliver an efficient market, I would argue that it does. Making a market, um, meeting demand, um, increasing supply when you get the right price signals, that's what you do, uh, that's what you do. Now, what does that mean in terms of industry and investment in R&D? So I think you're right. I think that you need to go beyond that. That's fine in the short term in terms of actually clearing the market and making supply and demand match. But in the longer term, you need to take calls and invest in something that will give you future benefits in a future market that you're trying to create, which is the whole point behind R&D. So I think that's, that's I, I agree, it's something to talk about. Um, how do you bring about that greater, that greater long-term outlook and orientation? Um, the point on demand and domestic demand, I mean, if you look at South Korea's industrial transformation, South Korea is a tiny country rel relative to India. They very consciously said that the world was their market. China is a huge country. They also said the world is their market. Um, they're now doing stupid things, but the, you know, it's, it's the, uh, it's, we should not be restricted by domestic demand. Mm -hmm. We should see for R&D certainly the two, the two functions that are the most scale, where scale economies, I think most apply are R&D and marketing, yeah. right? Uh, much more than production or sales. And it seems to me that if you want to benefit from the scale economies for R&D, um, you have to see the world as your market. Uh, so investment in international business, investment in global markets, and investments in R&D, I think, go together. Uh, the question on diminishing returns. Actually, you know, there's a lot of work that's been done that shows that if you look at investments in technology, you actually have increasing returns. Um, you know, this was uh, who Brian Arthur and uh, I think has, and some of his colleagues has done some work in this. And it's worth looking at because why? Because uh, as you know, technology is a non-rival good. Um, as you do more with it, you don't use it up. You actually enrich it um, and add to it because uh, um, you're, you're, you're growing your understanding and pool of, uh, uh, of technology. Um, and if you look at real, the farmer comment, um, real-term spending on R&D in pharma has not fallen. Um, it has increased. What has fallen is the percentage of sales uh, on R&D, but all there too, very modestly. I think by from about 11, 12% to around 9%. So it's, 
it's still, do we need to do more? Yes, we need to do more, but the industry has been growing. What we need to do is to see the pharma industry emerge as much more uh, dominant large players. Uh, you know, the uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but we're the world's third largest pharma manufacturer in terms of volume. But I can't remember the number, but I think we're world number eight, 11, 11, 11 in terms of value, right? Um, that gap yeah. is an R and D technology yeah. gap. Yeah. Uh, two more, I guess. Uh, the point on low technology industry. I'm not making any argument against low technology industry. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying we have a skill and capital intensive industrial structure. If we want to see it thrive, mm -hmm. um, we need to invest much more in technology and R and D. Uh, I fully agree. I think the importance of labor intensive industry is essential for us in terms of economic well-being, mm -hmm. um, in terms of employment, uh, and in terms of long-term growth as well. I fully subscribe to that. I don't think it's an either or question. Yeah. I think we're such a large country. We That's need true. both. Yeah. We need the labor intensive industrialization, but the policies that you need for labor intensive industrialization are different to the policies that I think you need for more technology intensive industrialization for the sectors that need it. Yeah. So, and I think it's good to think about though, them both um, in different buckets. So take the PLI scheme. Yeah. The PLI scheme can have an effect on the technology intensive industrialization. I don't see it having any effect on the labor intensive industrialization. Um, I think that would need different mechanisms of industrial policy, a good, good subject for, uh, for the conference or future conferences. The point on a scientific temper is totally well taken. I mean, our first prime minister spoke extremely eloquently on what a scientific temper is. Um, and what we need to do as a country to build it uh, across our population. Um, I think that I think I think the work is uh, still well undone, um, and we we still need to we still need to go a long way. And I think uh, uh, when we see when we see public statements that are illogical. Uh, not based on science, not based on rationality. Uh, it does us a disservice in the in the long run, and we should all push back and politely argue and say that listen, this is what uh, the march of science can do. Uh, it doesn't say that it provides all the solutions, but this is what it can actually do. Um, and then the last question on MNCs. I mean, you know, MNCs are never going to never going to meet our needs. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd, I, I see no issue with them setting up development centers in India. I mean, over half of three quarters, actually, of the top 500 firms in the world have development centers in India. Um, what I take from that is that Indian firms need to see the same availability of talent in the country is a massive benefit. Uh, and if GE can invest uh, and set up, uh, invest in, you know, hire 5,000 chemical uh, and chemis uh, chemical engineering and chemistry PhDs, um, why can't Reliance? Uh, you know, if, uh, if, if uh, uh, Bosch can invest in 20,000 Indian engineers for its own R&D facilities uh, worldwide, um, why can't uh, l &T? So, I mean, these are, to me, I think we should see this as a, uh, again, not either or, encourage the MNCs to set up development centers here, but have no expectation that they're going to work on right. Indian needs, that they're going to develop products for India, that they're going to help the Indian economy beyond employing people perfectly well and, he and healthily for us. Hmm. Um, but then you, you, need, you need Indian firms that worry about, uh, you know, I mean, as I think many people have shown in their work, R&D tends to be, even today, for the world's leading multinationals, tends to be an, a disproportionately local enterprise. Mm. Uh, a South Korean firm will do more of its R&D in South Korea. An American firm, whatever it says, they will set up R&D centers around the world, but they'll do most of their R&D in the US. Yeah. A German firm in Germany and a Japanese firm in Japan. Mm. So 
it's a yeah. it's a it's a it's a significantly local enterprise all around the world and we should expect that to apply to our firms too yeah. so i think that's some well, i think a round of applause yeah. for uh, a brilliant lecture and uh, very scintillating lecture and then answering all the questions very faithfully so we are very much enlightened and for that we are very grateful to you noshad for finding time to fit this in your schedule. I want to now invite our chairman to make some closing remarks. Well, I'm so glad that we invited Dr. Nasad to deliver this lecture. In most of the presentations, I found that there was very little reference to R&D. And I think you've done a a great service in highlighting the importance of R&D, pointing out the example of Korea and China. They took them over 20 years. Of course, we have a certain base and it would not require that period of time. But if we start thinking now and emphasizing on the various firms and on the government, the need for uh, focusing on our so in the long term we are going to i would not be surprised that we may even overtake considering our resources our population and our, this thing we should be able to when we reach the, uh, the number three status this is going to help and i'm also glad that uh, dr Rashad referred to mncs that we have to be self-reliant, basically. They are there as a filler, but not to expect that MNCs are going to solve our problems. Mm -hmm. In any case, even when they have their thing, they'll be focusing on their interests, yeah, not on ours. That's fine. So, and that's uh, very important. And also, uh, one of the things that uh, generally we suffer from and that we should avoid is the either-or approach. Absolutely. Uh, that, Absolutely. That's very dangerous. And that <laughs> shows that, yeah, you see, there are different systems. They can coexist. We have to look at right. what is uh, most suited for us. And this thing. And I think basically the approach the government of Make in India, on, uh, on basically on self reliance, that is going to take us forward. And it is this approach that was not there earlier yeah. that we are now doing the correctives. Yeah. So thank you very much, Dr. Nishad. Thank you. We are very grateful to you and we are indebted to you for this thank thing. You. It is a privilege to have you with us. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.